Well, the Dodgers did win last night, so they're back to the good news. And they're only one and a half games back. They're in third place, and they're one and a half games back. And the Giants are 11 games back. The Kings are too bad. Yesterday we had a wedding, so of course Friday night during the rehearsal, the toilet locked oh, no. very badly, and the, um, Ross here helped me yes. follow the bride, and um, so we were there until 9:30 or so trying to figure out the problem. The stupid snake I had wouldn't go down very far. So the next morning I get here at 8.30, and I get a hold of Sherman finally, and he comes over, and we puzzle over it, and we eventually take the toilet off, and try snaking that way, it didn't work. So then we called, or Sherman called the plumber, who finally showed up about 1.30, oh. <laughs> and it took him all 10 minutes to fix the problem, and then we put the toilet back and the all as well. Oh. And my daughter, my youngest daughter, um, is spending the weekend with a friend. And so at 2 o'clock in the morning, Friday night, I get a call from her saying that she wants me to bring comes to her. I tell her to drink some milk. <laughs> so on five and a half hours sleep, I uh, formed the wedding line yesterday. Um, so, yeah, interesting weekend. Um, our passage today is Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. As I mentioned before, this is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, starting in 1517. On Halloween, uh, All Hallows Eve, the day before All Saints Day, as Baptists, we don't pay attention to those sorts of things. We're lucky if we mention or notice Christmas and Easter. But October 31st is Reformation Day. And according to the story, that's the day that Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. Now, the Reformation has had some impressive consequences on the way the world functions, more so than you might think. I mean, besides the fact that you know we're Baptists and we're not Catholic, that's a big deal. That's obviously a consequence of the Reformation. But there are other things that are a consequence of the Reformation that you might not realize. Uh, one of the things that happened because of the Reformation were a series of religious wars, one of which was the Thirty Years' War, which lasted from uh, 1618 to 1648, if you really care. <laughs> However, you should care because what ended that war of religion was called the Peace of Westphalia which again, you probably don't care about. You think, what does this matter? It affects you every day. The fact that we are used to a system of government where we have nations, where you have clearly defined borders and all of that, that's a consequence of that piece. Nations didn't exist prior to 1648. We think they've always been around. Our modern concept of nation started in 1648. They didn't exist before that. The other thing that happened as a consequence of the Reformation is capitalism. You think the capitalism is the way it's always been. No. You've heard of the Protestant work ethic. That's where, that's where capitalism grows out of. Capitalism is a consequence of that. Our concept of liberty, separation of church and state. One of the reasons the Founding Fathers separated church and state is because they remembered the 30 years of religious wars. They didn't want to see that happen again. So you keep saying, you church and state separate, you don't have that problem. And our concept of liberty, to a large extent, freedom, grows out of that individual soul liberty that each person with the Holy Spirit can interpret for himself or herself the Bible. The idea that the Bible is comprehensible to the average person, all these things came out of the Reformation. The fact that you have a Bible in your own language, to a large extent, is because of the Reformation. The idea of reading the Bible every day, very recent concept. Prior to the Reformation, people didn't do that. Of course, it was hard to have a Bible since you didn't have printing presses. They were expensive. So a lot of things came out of the Reformation that you may not be aware of. 
And the reason I focus, besides it being the 500th anniversary this year, Book of Romans was played a large role in the Reformation. It's what triggered Martin Luther to do what he did. So today's passage, Romans chapter uh, six, thank you. I did get six and a half hours sleep last night, so I did that. <laughs> Uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23 is today's passage, and I'll go ahead and read that to you. Uh, 6, 15 through 23. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Did I turn this on? No, I did not. That's why. Oh, now I'm noisy. Uh, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you are slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life to Christ, in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have once again to gather in your house. I ask that you bless each person here in Jesus' name. Amen. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Now, Paul knows you could. You could just keep on sinning. There's nothing that's going to stop you except the indwelling Holy Spirit, of course. But, you know, you can always walk back into the prison and grab hold of the chains and sit there and say, you know, I'm happy here. Probably not. A mentally ill person, and I speak from experience since my youngest daughter is, um, if they don't take their medication, they may imagine that life is fine for them, that things are going okay. But on some level, as they're sitting in the gutter, homeless, and not having any food to eat, they may have some sense that perhaps things aren't all together, and that the voices in their head aren't really there. And maybe they'll eventually figure out that they need to take their medication. But as Christians, metaphorically speaking, attempting to live in that box by the side of the road, you'll have a harder time holding on to the illusion that you're not sick and that you don't need help because the Holy Spirit, your medication, is there with you. That is, you don't get to be unmedicated as a Christian. And as a Christian, you have your meds all the time. And so if you decide that you're going to go back and live in a box by the side of the road, you're not really going to be happy no matter how much you say to yourself, everything's fine, you know, I like my set. <coughs> not really. Uh, you'll have a much harder time of it. The, that is, every day you'll wake up, look around the gutter, and wonder why you don't just get up and go back home. In Luke chapter 15, verses 13 through 20, you have the story of the prodigal son. And it says that not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his life, or his wealth, in a wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So yes, you can keep on sinning, you can keep on being miserable, eventually you're going to get tired of living that way. 
when our all our children we adopted out of foster care. And I remember one time the um, social worker that was working with us who talked about the biological family, and they tended to, for short periods of time, do what they're supposed to do, is go to rehab, stay off the drugs, all those sorts of things. And our social worker told us they can only hold their breath for so long. That is, eventually they go right back to living the bad lifestyle. Well, as Christians, we can only hold our breath so long, you know, with the sinning type of thing. Eventually, we're going to go running back to the Father. You don't want to be a slave to sin. You much prefer being a slave to righteousness, a slave to God. Something that Paul mentions repeatedly in the beginning of all the letters that he writes is that he is a servant of God, a slave of God. It's because in our slavery to God, that's when we're most free, which is paradoxical, I suppose. But in John chapter 15, verses 15 through 17, Jesus said this, I no longer call you servants or slaves because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So yes, you can keep on sinning, but God will still be your Father. And you'll be trying to eat cake food, but you won't be liking it very much. Romans 16, 17 through 18. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Though you used to be slaves, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching. How do you go about doing that? How is it that you're obeying from your heart? Well, what's the new covenant? that God has created in us, Hebrews chapter 8. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and therefore you obey what God has asked you to do. You can't not do it. It's easy to think in terms of the Holy Spirit enrolling us as just being this doctrine, but it's, it's an actual reality. It does have an enormous impact on how you lead your lives. You can't help be transformed as a consequence of this. This is why you won't be happy continuing to live in the box and eating pig food. Romans 6, 19-23 says, I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Verse 19, it says, so now, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. This is a process. This is a process that will take our entire lives. That is, you're not going to arrive at the state of ultimate holiness and happiness. It's a process. It's going to take time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor during uh, World War, well, before World War II and then during World War II, uh, he was executed by the Nazis about two weeks before the end of the war. And he wrote a book called Ethics. And in it, he points out that being focused on doing the right thing or not doing the wrong thing is actually alien to what we were supposed to be. If you look at Genesis chapter um, 1, 2, and 3, God told us not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I mentioned before that when we think about that, we tend to focus on the fact that we were supposed to avoid sin. That is, we weren't supposed to know about evil. But you notice it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We weren't supposed to know about good either. 
We weren't supposed to think in those categories. The fact that we think in those categories now can't help but think in those categories now is how messed up we are. That is, we remain in that messed up state because of what happened then. What we were supposed to do is simply <coughs> run other people and just do for them without even thinking in terms of those kind of categories. <coughs> we would just naturally, automatically be focused on achieving the happiness of the other people around us. The story is told about a person that God took them to show them what hell is like. And they go down to hell and there's a big table and around the table are uh, seated a bunch of people and on the table are bowls of soup. And each person at the table has one arm tied behind their back and on the other arm is strapped a large spoon that's about three feet long. And they're all desperately trying to figure out how to scoop up the soup and get it in their mouths and of course not succeeding. The person then is taken to heaven to see what heaven's like. And it looks virtually the same. Big table, bowls of soup, people with one hand tied behind their back, three foot spoon in this hand. They're scooping um, soup across the table and feeding each other. We focus ideally on just doing for other people, not thinking in terms of what am I going to get out of it. That's the problem when you start thinking in terms of good and bad. That wasn't the idea. That's not what we were intended to be. But it's what has happened to us. Verses 22 through 23, but now you have been set free from sin have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The verse 23 is a famous one. You probably have quoted it, probably have memorized it. Whether you set out to memorize it or not, it's probably something that's gotten stuck in your head. How many of you have heard of the Romans Road? by a few of you. Romans Road is a tool that can be used for evangelism. Now there are a lot of different ways to approach people with the gospel. This is one of the ways that you can do it. The book of Romans is kind of designed to bring people to the knowledge of Christ. And so the Romans Road, what it does is it takes a few verses from the book of Romans and you lead someone through those verses as you're presenting the gospel to them. And so this verse, Romans 3.23, is one of those points along the road, one of the signposts. Now, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, that's something that every human being realizes. Jesus said that what, what is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. We don't have to do that. That's what the Holy Spirit does naturally. Our job is... Christians is not to point out people's sin. That's something the Holy Spirit takes care of. As Christians, our job is to present the gospel. So you could take someone to Romans 3, uh, 3.23 and point that out. Or you could do Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then the next step along the way would be, say, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the good news. Romans 5.12, therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. And then Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's very easy to use Paul's letter to the book of Romans to present the gospel, the good news to people, because that's what the whole letter is about. And you can pick out, you know, any set of, you know, a lot of different verses from Romans. You don't have to use these, and you don't have to use this method. And one of the comforting things if you're presenting the gospel to people is that you're not on your own when you're doing that. The Holy Spirit's there involved with it. 
And so just relax. Allow God to work through you if you have the opportunity to share the gospel with someone. Uh, you really can't trust God. And in fact, you really need to trust God. Nothing in life quite works well if you don't trust the creator of our life. That is, God is always there with you. God is always going to help you in whatever it is that you're doing. So don't be afraid when you're trying to present the gospel to someone. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we've had this morning to look into your word bit. Ask that you bless each person that's here, bless our time, fellowship afterwards, and whatever we have to do today and this weekend. In Jesus' name.